This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. I had a really good time travel joke to start the episode with, but it turned out none of you liked it. So today we start off our sixth year here on Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, and I'm your host, Isaac Arthur. As we travel from 2019 to 2020, time travel seemed like a good topic, and I figured we'd start by discussing why we don't think it can work under known physics, then talk about what the implications would be if it turned out we were wrong. Of course the thing I always take as the biggest proof time travel isn't possible is that nobody is offering package deals for temporal vacations. If time travel were possible, we should see folks from the future and the past everywhere and every when. And not just a few secretive folks with a time machine like we see so often in science fiction. People don't really seem to look much at what the extended and expanded use of such a technology would be. While that may be forgivable when a story contains such a technology having just been invented, so everything revolves around a prototype or its first use. This doesn't really work with time travel since it's being invented and used at any point means it's basically been invented and used at all points in time. If you manage to invent time travel, you ought to be able to walk out of the machine a moment later and be welcomed by all your admirers and descendants from when you hopped back in time to say cure smallpox or similar. Needless to say, a lot depends on how time works, which depends a lot on what time actually is, and honestly we still don't really know. We'll try to look at how time travel might function, or not function, under a few of the main concepts folks have offered for explaining time later in the episode. First though, let's talk about the issue with time travel under modern relativity, and then under modern quantum mechanics, where they don't quite match. In relativity, time is a flat, linear thing plotting on at a set rate in the same way planets are flat, which is to say they aren't, unless you build one that way but they usually look flat or fairly flat at low altitudes, get up high and it doesn't look flat at all. Space-time, on the other hand, looks rather flat at low gravities and accelerations, but when those are high it doesn't look flat at all. On a curved planet you can only see so far because of the horizon, and something much the same applies to space-time curvature, the edge of the Universe is actually our cosmological horizon and as far as we can see, but we're pretty sure it keeps going on a long way after that. As we look further from Earth in any direction, we see objects receding away from us at faster and faster speeds, eventually so fast they can no longer be seen because space expands between us and them faster than light can cover the new space being added. Or so we assume, we obviously can't see those places, but if it didn't we'd actually be at the center of our Universe and indeed we are when we normally reference the Universe as that shorthand for the observable Universe, which practically speaking is all there is since we can never see or speak to or travel to the rest without some sort of faster than light technology. The problem is the faster you go, the more energy you need to get to that speed and the more you need for each increment higher. More and more of your total energy is of the kinetic or potential variety rather than mass energy, that E equals MC squared thing. The more your total energy is not mass, the slower time is passing for you. If you look at some object that appears as stationary relative to you, like say a coffee cup you're holding, all of its energy is just mass energy, almost all anyway. There is a little heat energy in that warm coffee which is trivial compared to its mass energy, which is the rough equivalent of a dozen megaton hydrogen bombs, hence why coffee is so great for giving you energy presumably. If you were to add an equal amount of kinetic energy or speed to that coffee cup, it would now have half of its energy in the form of kinetic energy, zipping along at 86% of the speed of light. Since only half of its energy is now mass energy, it will experience half as much time as would a stationary object. If we were to double the cup's kinetic energy, with only one third of its energy being in mass energy and two thirds of its energy is kinetic, and the cup would experience time at one third of a stationary object and it would be rocketing along at 94% of the speed of light. It's impossible to actually reach the speed of light because it takes more and more energy, kinetic energy, for each percent closer to light speed you go. It took the same energy to get from 86% of light speed to 94% as it did from starting at rest and up to 86%, and in fact it takes 7 times that to get to 99%, 22 times that to get to 99.9%, 
and 70 times that to get to 99.99%. So we say you can't get to light speed because you need infinite energy to do that, but I think this sometimes gives people the wrong impression that you could actually hit light speed if you just had some phenomenal power source. Mass is essentially what experiences time and things without mass, like photons or gravitons, experience none. All objects split their energy between motion through space and motion through time. How much time you have pass is all about what portion of your total energy is your mass energy. Go 99.99% of light speed and time runs at a 70th the normal speed, and I think it's easier conceptually to ask how you'd ever eliminate all your mass entirely, infinite power or not, as that's the only way you can move at light speed. Time slows down until you hit light speed, at which point it stops entirely, and as a result photons and gravitons and other light speed particles don't experience time, whereas ultra low mass particles like neutrinos, which move at nearly light speed, experience very little time. If you could go faster than light, then by that relativistic equation, you would be experiencing time not just very slowed down, but running backwards. Again, that's the usual explanation and I imagine most of you have heard it before. For my part I think it's a bit easier to ask first, how would you ever remove all your mass to be going light speed, and second, how you would somehow have a negative mass to be going backward in time. See the Things Which Will Never Exist episode for discussion of negative mass and other negative quantities. It is not coincidental that virtually every proposed type of fast and light travel relies on negative mass or energy, which we have not yet detected or created a single particle of, contrary to some grossly inaccurately titled popular science articles. For this same reason, we always point out that almost all these methods open the door to time travel. When it comes to normal matter at least, we could not move so much as a single atom at the speed of light if we used every bit of energy in the entire Universe and we need more than infinity to make it move backward in time. We might get around these issues somehow one day, but hopefully it's a bit clearer why FTL and time travel so often get phrased as an impossibility, not just some technical issue that can be solved by sheer determination. It's not like traveling to the moon, it's like making 2 plus 2 equal 5, and when we say this or that theory might allow FTL or time travel, What we usually mean is that the theory doesn't explicitly forbid it thus far. One of those methods that does get kicked around is using a wormhole, and those require the use of negative mass or energy, and actually only let you travel back in time to when the wormhole was created, a result of closed time-like curves or CTCs. This is a world line, a path through space-time that eventually leads you back to the exact same coordinates in space and time. Think of it like any curved path you might walk down and end up coming back to where you started, like a circular running track, only you also come back to when you started. Now assuming we had this option invented, somehow, it might make for some interesting civilizations. You can't go back and see the dinosaurs or end some war in ancient history before it began, but you can go back to the moment it was invented and built. Isaac Asimov uses this sort of time travel in his novel The End of Eternity, which happens to be my favorite book by him. There, a group of time travelers called the Eternals, who live in a pocket of space-time and can travel anywhere inside time between when the device was invented till the end of the sun, and use the death throes of the sun dying as their power source for time travel. The book spends a fair amount of time looking at how that impacts civilization, since they are not secret time travelers and actually engage in trade between centuries. Indeed that was the original purpose and they had later began trying to change events to engineer better futures by making very tiny and calculated changes, like sabotaging someone's vehicle not to start up before they'd have gone on to attend some major event that shaped them into being a dictator or similar. You can see our episode The Butterfly Effect for an idea just how small you could make a change and expect it to have world altering effects a few centuries down the road. Trying to predict those in terms of an outcome is far harder of course. We'll discuss that scenario for a civilization, one that can travel back to the time such travel got invented but not before, in a bit. First though, I mentioned quantum mechanics is a bit different than relativity for time travel, and it actually offers us many pathways that could either allow time travel, or just sort of trick us into thinking we had. One of those is the notion that you aren't traveling to your own past but one very similar, 
out of the multiverse concept of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. We're not going to get into the weeds of how quantum permits or might permit time travel, but here you're not actually traveling to your own past, so you don't have to worry about the grandfather paradox, because it's not your past you're changing, just something very close to it. The grandfather paradox is where you go back in time and accidentally kill your grandfather, I assume accidentally anyway, and as a result are never born and can't travel back in time to kill him. Needless to say, that's an extreme case, but it's the notion that something you do in the past would cause you not to be able or interested in doing the trip after you made that change. You travel back in time to save JFK from being assassinated and now you no longer have a motivation to do so. Against that we have the self-consistency principle, which is that you'd inevitably have events between when you went back to and when you left from play out so as to make the trip still happen. Conceptually this is like water evaporating from the ocean and falling down as rain on the land. That water can take any number of paths back down to the ocean again but still gets there. For instance, you go back to next week with today's winning lottery numbers but write yourself a note saying you need to make that trip. It's not that any given action is predestined to happen the same, just that only those various sequences of events that lead back to causing you to get into that time machine actually continue to exist while all the others essentially poof out as hazy possibilities that can't exist. The raindrop can fall many places and follow many courses to flow to the same place and time. Many timelines are possible but only those that lead to a self-consistent time travel event can be stable and exist. That one works a bit better under the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum, which is the Schrodinger's cat version where it's alive and dead simultaneously till absorbed as opposed to many worlds where in one universe it's alive and in the other it's dead and you just don't know which one you're in till you open the box and checked. As an analogy to self-consistency, events are in quantum flux till absorbed, like with the cat, at which point only one possibility has happened and the others wink out, and only a self-consistent time travel event could be absorbed. This presumably results in no option for paradoxes, always a problem with time travel as no paradoxical sequence will not wink out. This paradox issue is a sore spot in some science fiction franchises. What exactly was the point of the crew of Voyager going back in time to fix histories they didn't like, when it was made clear elsewhere in the franchise that this wouldn't change their history at all, only create a different history for someone else to enjoy, one among infinity. Another, more interesting possibility for paradox avoidance is that as the mini worlds branch off from one another, some branches are pruned. Only the branches that contain no violations of the laws of physics or logic remain on the tree. And so if you did try to kill your grandfather, then starting at the moment of his near death, the universe would branch into the histories where you succeeded and the histories where you failed, and only the latter would survive. What you would experience would be frustrating failure after failure, because no matter how bizarre or contrived a coincidence was required to prevent you from killing him, only the histories in which you failed and produced your father would be left. If this is true, there would be no reason for time travelers to worry about causing a paradox, because the universe absolutely would not let them. And indeed you can argue it can't possibly be your true past anyway, because the universe we're in has a set amount of matter and energy and if someone from next year just arrived here and now, they'd be adding mass and energy, mass and energy that's interacting with stuff like producing gravity. So even if we transported you back in time to some sealed underground bunker, that little extra mass is slightly altering the Earth's spin, how much gravity exerts on the moon, and so on, changing the future, even if apparently very little. Little effects can have massive long-term changes, again see the butterfly effect, but from a multiverse perspective it's a different universe if even a single atom is not exactly where it otherwise would have been. Conservation of mass and energy isn't the entirety of it, you can't get around this by just exchanging equal masses of material between two times, they'd have to be identical, the same state, to switch and not produce changes to the state of the universe, and throwing something backward in time to replace something identical in every way which would include positions and states of memories in brain or hard drive, is not meaningful time travel. So you couldn't just teleport data from tomorrow back to today on your hard drive so it told you tomorrow's lottery numbers, even though you wouldn't seem to have changed the mass or energy of the universe. And indeed that sort of quantum teleportation, changing the states on bits on a hard drive, 
is one of those possible FTL or time travel notions that gets kicked around and probably would not work. Another cheat approach to quantum time travel is that even though the odds of it are beyond minuscule, there's always a chance of things assembling effectively at random. So you could have a bunch of atoms randomly assemble into a person with memories of being from the 22nd century. Those odds, while again vanishingly small, are still larger than the total number of universe combinations in a multiverse where everything that can happen will happen. So if Mini Ward's interpretation is correct, there are universes where someone identical to you, right now, has emerged in the time and place your grandfather and grandmother first met and interrupted their date, raving about being transported to the wrong date and causing them not to meet and fall in love. No grandfather paradox results from this though. There's also one where you think you've invented time travel, blowing yourself up turning the machine on, and a copy of yourself, identical to the moment you threw the switch, appears at the intended destination time and place, smugly convinced the machine worked. See the Infinite Improbability Issues episode for more craziness associated with multiverses. But while that technically isn't time travel, it effectively is for all practical purposes except the paradox, and of course not being something you can really choose to do. Okay, that's the not too quick overview of the mechanics of how time travel and paradoxes might or might not work. Let's consider some scenarios for those if they did work. What sort of civilization gets produced? First, if the multiverse approach works, and lets you just travel there, adding mass and energy to some place when you arrive, this becomes really good news, because it means the number of possible universes is now infinite, rather than just very large. Many worlds generally assumes there's a universe for every single possible combination and arrangement of each particle. That's a huge number but not infinite because the mass of the universe is assumed to be finite, at least the pocket we call the observable universe. If I can add an atom to that I now create even more universes. One might argue it's still not actually infinite since you can only put so much matter in the universe without collapsing into a black hole, but as the universe expands that amount increases. You also get FTL travel out of it, since you can jump back in time, moving in a direction, jump back again, move again, and so on until you're at your destination, like the edge of the observable universe. So the number of possible realities you could visit and colonize is either infinite, or so large it makes no difference, and you never have to worry about the heat death of the universe because you could add or subtract mass and energy and entropy from any given time, or just move to a different one. Under more classic time travel you can avoid heat death too, by invading your own past. If the world was about to end you could jump back to when it was younger and colonize that, and it's presumably fine to do so since you can't do it if paradoxes are a problem as you'd erase the civilization that produced you and your time travel device. At the cosmic level you just jump back to a billion years after the Big Bang every time you run low on material. You might be wondering if that proves time travel can't happen since clearly no one did that, but logically that doesn't quite hold up as a bit of tautology, circular reasoning, which is kind of appropriate for contemplating circular bits of time I suppose. If the Universe permits no paradox of this type, time travel isn't possible so it doesn't matter, but if it does it's because you are getting new realities out of it, and there will be realities for every possible scenario including a reality that never had time travelers arrive in it prior to time travel being invented there, we'd just be in such a universe, or one where the footprint was minimal. Of course you also have the self-consistency angle as an option too, you jump back in time and colonize the early universe, but the pattern of possible futures leading to us only allows the ones where we'd be ignorant that occurred like they died off or grew very slowly and distantly from us so we hadn't noticed these temporal colonists yet. Tenses are rather confusing in time travel too, how do you refer to your own future that is your world's past or vice versa? I often get a bit confused when writing scripts on the show just because I often refer to things like last week's video, also discussing problems with time, which came out on December 26th. Except that it's not January 2nd, 2020 as I write this, it's October 28th, 2019. When I finish writing this script and upload it for the crew to edit, I'll get to work on making the video for November 7th, Cyber Security. It can get rather confusing at times and yesterday, Sunday October 27th, I was doing a live chat session after our live stream on our Discord server 
and started referencing people to our Space Pirates episode for a detailed explanation of what I was discussing at that moment, only that episode hadn't come out yet. I'll also sometimes reference episodes that don't exist, because some bit of material got removed from the draft for time constraints or to improve the flow of the episode, and I forgot. Those unused scripts or versions of scripts are similar to timelines that never happened, due to changing time, and presumably there are ones where those episodes were made. That's probably a small hint at the sort of tense confusion time travel civilizations would get. How do you refer to something you plan to do yesterday, or that you already did tomorrow? If this sort of travel is common and non-paradoxical because it's a sequence of multiverses, how do you phrase an explanation to your friends when you come into the office in the morning, sporting much longer hair and beard and say you just came out of a timeline where your wife died in a car accident so you had to skip back and fix that, and how it was a very nice funeral and then the two of you went on a vacation afterwards because it was a bit stressful? How about when a long or bearded copy of your co-worker Bob walks in and says it's going to be a busy day, and then one with an even longer beard comes in and says, good news everyone, tomorrow we close the deal with our new client, but we all need to do some extra overtime last weekend. It would tend to seem like cohesive timelines would utterly break down too, and you might get weird or day-to-day options like dating apps that let you swipe forward or back instead of left or right, to find the girl or boy of your dreams from a different century and sit down on your first date and see what your future would look like. Now in fiction we often get some sort of rules preventing tons of time travel, concepts like inertia of future events, or changes requiring more effort the further back you seek to make them, but often it's actual legal rules, and that's problematic because it doesn't really seem enforceable to have temporal police, someone just goes back in time and prevents them being formed. If they've got some sort of widget that prevents such things happening, some sort of time shield, then they can presumably build a bigger one that protects their whole civilization too, and folks can do as they please elsewhere. I get a time travel device and nothing is stopping me from taking some classes in Latin and Roman history, grabbing lots of textbooks and schematics and modern widgets, and jumping back to Caesar's day and setting myself up as Emperor or jumping forward to the future to get some life extension treatments and awesome cybernetic enhancements and then jumping back to the past to set myself up as an immortal leader. If you do have that infinite number of timelines option, this might be a better alternative to virtual realities, where you can be whatever you please as it might be cheaper and easier and more real feeling to just hurl folks to other timelines. There should always be one where the only difference with your normal history was that someone identical to you popped up at a given time and place, at which point it diverges. We usually say technologies like FTL and time travel only exacerbate the Fermi Paradox, the big question of where all the aliens are, because it now means you have to contemplate aliens from a much broader region of space and also ones from the future jumping into the early universe, but this is one alternative that nobody spreads out to the stars because they just colonize early or parallel histories of their own world, and we just happen to live in a timeline where that hasn't happened. Confusing stuff that's giving me a headache, so I'm going to close out here and get to work on the Cyber Security episode for November 7, 2019, which I already finished as I record this on November 1st, 2019. But first, let me wish you an excellent 2020, now that 2019 is over. When contemplating time travel or fantasizing about it, which I imagine I'm not alone in doing, one common problem is all those missing skills you need to actually have to live back then, whenever then was. We have a very skill-based society compared to prior eras, but they had a lot of skills we generally lack, so if you just popped up in some ancient kingdom, you'd have a rough time surviving without knowing the language or how to do things like grind grain or swing a sword around. But we do live in a far more skill-based society than in olden times, and it's always handy to be acquiring more skills. Plus, it's nice just to have them, even when they aren't meant for career purposes they offer fun new hobbies and a feeling of confidence that you can get stuff done. That's why I like Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in a wide range of topics like design, business, technology, and many more. Even just those focusing on productivity or time management, like Thomas Frank of College Info Geek's course, Productivity Masterclass. A premium membership is less than $10 a month and gives you access to that course and all the rest, and you can try it out for free. 
Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my listeners, get 2 months of Skillshare for free. To sign up, visit the link in the description and get 2 months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Act now for this special offer and start learning today. So that will wrap up our show for the day, but we'll be back next week to our Alien Civilization series to take a look at alien conspiracies and aliens who conspire and ask what sort of motives they might have for a given conspiracy. The week after that we'll return to the Moon to look at what industries might arise there and help us develop an interplanetary society, in Moon, Industrial Complex. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes, visit our website, IsaacArthur.net, to donate to the show or look over our inventory of over 200 episodes or our awesome SFIA merchandise. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great year!